audio now? Do we have audio yet? Now we do. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I, you would not believe how witty, charming, and important the stuff I just said was. It's never going to happen again. It was, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'm sorry you, you, you missed all of that. That's what happens when you forget to turn, turn your mic packs on, everybody. Welcome once again to another edition of Grassroots Motorsports Live. I'm JG Pasterjack. This, you, you are here on a fantastic night. We have some, uh, some learned young gentlemen here from the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University from their Formula SAE team to explain some of the things in this book. I'm gonna, like if a, if a porno magazine falls out of the binding of this book, I'm gonna be really impressed with these guys, but I don't think that's gonna happen. But uh, there, is, there is some amazing stuff in this book. We're gonna be talking tonight about anti-squat and anti-dive in particular, which are concepts that I, from being a former uh, Mustang owner, from, from having to put a lot of horsepower to the ground through a solid rear axle, I am sort of familiar with in a tertiary fashion. i um, looking forward to learning a lot more about the math and physics that go into those concepts tonight and really excited to hear about what these guys have coming up with their Formula SAE program. All right, we're going to get into that in just a minute. Before we do, though, let me tell you about a couple of important things. First off, let's give a shout out to the nice people that support this show. I'm talking about our friends from CRC Industries. Uh, moments before we went live, moments before we were, we were forgetting to turn the, um, the, the audio on, I was using this VisiClear display cleaner. Um, oh, look at this. I'll, I'll, even put a, I'll put a hat on for you people. Look at that. I, 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 I'm, I'm not a hat wearer. Um, I, I don't look good in hats. But for you, I will, I will make, make the jump. I cleaned my glasses with this. I cleaned the lenses of our camera with this. I cleaned the screen that Katie is over there watching this broadcast on with VisiClear Display Cleaner. We are huge fans of everything that CRC makes because they make great products and also because they give a little bit back to this industry. So please check them out at retailers near you. Also, check out our friends from Coney Shocks, Coney-NA.com. Look at that. This is... This is um, Turned into a circus act all of a sudden. I love that we have um, we have top fans now. So thank you very much if you are a top fan. Um, thank you for being a top fan. If you're not a top fan, I don't know how you become a top fan. Just uh, keep 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 reaching for that rainbow. Keep keep trying. See my see some of my friends over on uh, YouTube right now. If you have a question anytime during the show, post it in the chat on YouTube. Post it in the chat on Facebook. Also, we would really appreciate it if you threw a, threw a like up there, threw a share up there. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. We really, really appreciate that. All righty. With that, I will bring on my new friend, Alex Zosh. Welcome to the garage, my friend. Hello. So, uh, you guys, first off, give me the, give me the, the 10,000 foot view of, of what life in a Formula SAE crew is like. Do you call it a crew? Do you call it a gang? Do you call it a squad? Uh, what's, team. What's team, team okay, usually. That's, but, uh, that, that, that's the classiest. So what, what, what year are you, are you in participating in this thing? So I have uh, one semester left after okay. this one, and then I will graduate in December. Uh, thinking about staying for a master's, possibly. So uh, we'll see. On that. Do, you, do you get to continue to participate in, in the team as long yes, as? Yes, yeah. So a lot of the best teams that there are at competition usually have a significant portion of their team filled with master students because okay. a lot of the problem is what we find is that we end up with people that come on for a year learn a whole lot get really into the program and then they leave they graduate they get a great job but then that kind of knowledge just doesn't get passed along yeah so um, a lot of the top teams have those masters and PhD students that are um, really uh, like that have had time and experience around like their systems and stuff they've been working on. And so they tend to do very well because of that. So, and we actually have a lot of our team this year is thinking about staying for a master's. Him or me? Talk louder or turn, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, well, no, so it's, 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 what yeah. was the question again? I Sorry. don't remember. We, so, so, but, so you, you, you've sort of transitioned from being being freshman sophomore to now with a point where you're yeah, so probably mentoring some of the. Actually, the, I just got involved last fall. So I've only been on the team really like as a lead for a year, and then uh, the spring before that, I was around for a little bit. Just and I went to competition with them to kind of learn what was going on, but. Uh, uh, yeah, that's. I actually have not been on the team all that long, and I wish I had gotten started earlier. That's and very cool. that's what pretty much everyone says. So, if you're not familiar with Formula SAE, it is basically a competition to design, build, and and market a, a single-seater formula car to 
two sports car enthusiasts, two, two racers. So it, you're on, on the design side. We actually have, have Micah here from the, the, the business side. Mm -hmm. And we're going to bring him on a little bit later to explain some of that stuff to you. But want everybody out there to do us, do us a favor. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But um, if, if you want to help out the, uh, the, the young geniuses at the um, SAE program at Embry-Riddle, take a survey that they, are, they, they, they have put together. We'll throw the link up there right now. It's a, it's a tiny URL link. Um, go there. It's like what a four or five question survey. It's not. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Five it's, it's 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 five five minutes of your time. It's going to help them out a lot. It's sort of some basic market um, research. We'll 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 hear hear more about that later. But they it, this is a very involved program. It's not just engineering. It's it's not just design. It is all phases of of constructing and bringing to market a a very cool product. So that would be a huge help to them. So uh, we'll we'll throw that up there. Okay, so let's get into this. So what is your official role on, on the team? So I'm the team's suspension lead. Which is, blends perfectly into what we're going to set up tonight, which is we, we asked you guys when we had our little meeting a few weeks ago, we're like, let's, let's take some concepts mm -hmm. and let's break them down for, sure. for the viewers, for, for the readers. And the first one that we came up with was anti-dive and anti-squat, which I think is something that everybody feels the effect of, everybody mm -hmm. is sort of vaguely familiar with that it's a, it's a concept, but not all of us really sort of know how it actually actually works. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about anti-dive and anti-squat tendencies, what are we talking about? Okay, so with anti-dive and anti-squat, what it really essentially is, is that a portion of the load that is transferred, say, through braking or acceleration is being taken up by your suspension members instead of your springs. And what that means is that that load transfer is essentially instant, that percentage of it. So what that can do is it reduces your time constant for that load transfer. So say you step on the gas, it takes a second for your car to right, squat down as the uh, springs absorb the load transfer back and you don't get all your traction instantly. Now with uh, antis, essentially what that's doing is say you had 100% anti, now 100% of your load transfer is transferring through your control arms directly to your rear tires and you have instant grip instead of so that's why you'll see a lot of cars they'll take a second to squat down before they'll actually get the grip to take off so essentially that's what that's doing or if you if you think about like an old um gas or dragster is you know, something mm -hmm. with, with ladder bars in the back. Exactly. When a load's applied to the back, the rear actually mm -hmm. lifts up because yeah, you're creating leverage. Yeah, so leverages. you can actually have pop, like more than anti-squat, it's called uh, like pro-lift geometry, right. which is that you'll go above 100% and now um, some of that load is actually pushing up instead of going to push you forward, which increases your traction. I'm looking for our dry erase marker. Did, Katie, did you steal our dry erase marker? No, I took a different one. Oh my God. Okay, so we, we, we have a... Uh, but there, 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 there's, there's somebody else in the garage, everybody, stealing dry erase markers. So let's, let's start out with, with a, probably a, 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 the easiest example of, of, of anti-squat, which is probably a, a, a solid rear, rear axle car. So if you've got a rear axle here, if you've got a chassis here and a control arm coming off of off of this chassis to a to a, to a, to a bracket here. Mm -hmm. What are what are the forces in, in, in involved? What are the the, the leverages we're, we're we're trying to create, and how do they 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 relate to having this piece here connected to the axle and, and, and this piece the the axle 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 which can move vertically, obviously, mm -hmm. and the chassis which which can't. So what's 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 going on there? You know, in, in a very simple arrangement like that. Yeah. So essentially, you would have your center of gravity somewhere. Uh, we could say it was here, maybe, and um, you just usually just treat that as a point, and then from there, all that's really happening is you're accelerating forward. So um, essentially, the reaction force is this is coming back and it's reacted by the tire. So now um, a percentage of that is transferred through the control arm, a percentage would be transferred through, say if you had a spring there or something like that. Um, well, obviously it would not be there, but we don't have an eraser, do we? <laughs> we, have, we have a fine... If you had maybe a spring here or something like that, but uh, yeah, so that's essentially what's happening. Um, how you actually calculate it? Is that like what you would like me to get? Yeah, so, so I, 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 
let's 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 start with, with something like that. So so you have essentially a, a, a thrust vector from from this rear axle going going forward. I, I yeah, would so think. essentially it's the and, tires rotating, yeah. and then it's, I mean, giving you a little traction there, right? And so that same reaction is then now the center of gravity is experiencing that, and that creates a moment um, about that rear tire, and which is reacted there by the force of the of the tire itself. Okay, so on on this kind of kind of arrangement where you, you've got a fairly fairly simple arrangement with just a trailing arm locating that, what what can we move here? What can we affect? And 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 how to is to determine like a percentage right. that you're getting? Okay, yeah. So. Um, interestingly enough, with a solid axle, because your torque reaction is taken up by the chassis, um, that line, instead of being drawn from the center of the wheel, is actually from the tire contact patch. I mean, you can uh, see it right there on the book. Oh, yeah. So, like, I, that's a good example of that right there. So, with the solid axle, you have the torque is uh, being taken up from the tire, and then independent rear suspension, it would be from uh, the center of the tire. Gotcha. So, you got it, Chris. Mm -hmm. Everybody's ripping your, uh, your your books off at home now. So when we're talking about how much or, or how little of an effect we're getting, what is that's expressed in a percentage? It sounds like yes, exactly. So 100% being full load transfer through the suspension members, and 0% essentially being none. So um, how you would calculate that, I guess, in a situation here, is it would be the angle that that is. So. Um, you have some line going to your center of gravity, and then depending on what angle that is at compared to that, it gives you your percentage. Okay. So if this was essentially pointing straight up to the center of gravity, then you would have 100% anti-squat. And it's a little easier to see in uh, an independent rear suspension just because the reaction is from the center line of the wheel, so um, you can see that a little more straightforward. But uh, essentially, what you need to do is find your instant center. So right. With this, um, it would just be right there because this is a trailing arm. So, that, so, that, um, so everything is basically yeah, flexing. In, in, this, in this situation, so it's the instant center of this wheel rotating around the chassis, right? So, Which is actually going to describe a bit of an arc. I yes, would think, exactly. Right? So this becomes your instant center right here. And then what that means is that you have, your wheel would essentially follow that path, okay. right? If you were to allow this to swing freely. And depending on where that point lies along this axis gives you your percentage. So usually that is done with like a tangent, right? Just a basic trig. Mm -hmm. So you'd have some height here. We could maybe call that H and some distance here. And essentially from that angle, you can determine um, and you would have to obviously know the position of your center of gravity. So that's one thing that would uh, be helpful to have. <laughs> and when you know that, then you can essentially find this just by finding where your instant center is and the axis that it lies along relative to your center of gravity. So what about some of the actual localized leverages that are taking place in here? So like, it, it seems to me if you had, if you had a, a, a thrust vector coming from, from this axle moving forward basically, and this point and this point are trying to resist it, if you get this point in a situation where it's higher than this, than, than it, you know, the, the point on the axle, higher than the, the point on the chassis, the leverage is going to be wanting to push the chassis down and the, and the axle yeah, so up a little bit. Yeah, so that would essentially be pro-squat pro squat, geometry. Yeah. So you would actually be applying that force and doing the opposite essentially, of what you Yeah, moving do. the chassis down. So there would really be no reason to do that. It would just right. decrease your uh, traction because traction is based on normal force. So. Um, Again, like a good point to bring up here is that uh, this force right here, this is your normal force essentially on the tire. So, and that is reacted by the same force by the tire. Okay. F equals MA, right? And so the more anti effect you have, then uh, the low transfer actually essentially stays the same, but in the instant that it's happening, a percentage of that is transferred instantly. So if you had 100%, 100% is transferred instantly the second you step on the gas. If you had 0%, then there's a time constant in there that your springs take time to compress, but once they're fully compressed, it's essentially the same thing. And I'm imagining with, with a, a street car, even with something like our, our Corvette, mm -hmm. that the suspension is fairly locked down, but compared to 
a you know an 800 pound formula car, a 600 pound formula car that what like you guys are building mm -hmm. that doesn't move much, the variables as this articulates through its suspension travel are going to change a lot more than they are on on a car car like yours. So when you're talking about where your sort of optimum anti squat um, point is, or, or how do you how do you start to tune with with this this concept are you are, are you trying to use it to, to maximize corner exit or you... so really there's I mean kind of it, it depends what you're trying to right. achieve really so if you were a drag car essentially you don't really care about anything else other than going as fast as possible getting as much traction on your rear tires so you would probably want a hundred percent maybe more right and uh, as for like in our case with our car um, essentially that becomes a little more difficult because it becomes hard for the driver to handle. If they step on the gas and the second they step on the gas they have a hundred percent load transfer on the rear tires, that's going to become very unpredictable right. to drive. Because so. you, you're going to lose a ton of load off, off mm -hmm. of your, your, your steering. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, you would lose now that load off the front tires and take it back to the rear. And so essentially it's all a tuning thing and it is down to the driver too. So. Oh, we had a, had a couple people uh, want, want to know what, Millican and Millican. What, what, what book it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the Millican Father book. Father and this Son, is, Race Car Vehicle Dynamics. Yeah. Great read. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's a nice, light sort of, uh, if you're going on a cruise, this is what you, what you sit on, on, on the beach. And, um, of course. And, yeah, like, I'm, there, there, are, there are not enough pictures in here for me. Um, okay, so I want to move on to more complex suspensions in a minute here, but it, in general, when, when we're talking about tuning with an anti-squat, what else are we giving up? What are going to be some of the second order effects? You already, already mentioned the possibility of, of you know, transferring weight so fast that, mm -hmm. that, that you, you lose bite on the steering. Um, what are some of the other second order effects that we have to be, be ready for when we start using this as a tuning tool? So, I mean, essentially that would really be the only negative effect per se is it just comes down to that because it's essentially almost the same thing as having a rigid bar for a spring. Okay. Like, so it just makes it a little bit harder to drive. Another actually negative effect, I guess you could say, is dampers. So, um, obviously your spring travels, usually the damper travels as well and you're able to get damping and usually you want that damping to be through your whole travel, right? right. So you do lose the ability to tune damping if you had a 100% anti-scar. Okay. So that would be another disadvantage, I guess. Those would really be the only two main ones I could think of and then you also have the added problem with an independent suspension of potential toe gain if you don't set up your uh, toe links and uh, tie rods correctly. Yeah, so let's let's take a look at something a little more more complicated now. Um, let's talk maybe about about in, independent rears when we're talking okay. about sure about squat and, and how you, you so you you actually brought a couple of um, yes couple of control arms from uh, from from your car which are pretty amazing. Um, yeah, so. When it comes to building and designing these things, it's it's all stu completely 100% student-led and designed and, and built, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have manufacturers that help us, like for example, these parts right there, the forks on the end that hold yeah. the bearings, those are uh, water jet, first of all, by a company near us, and then post machine to a very tight tolerance with a chamfer that's specifically for those bearings. But the assembly all happens by us, so that was welded by Chandler, our team lead. Cool. Who's who's uh, who's watching right now? Actually. Yes, and uh, I, I think he mentioned that you were up on the on the projector. Um, oh, great! So, <laughs> hello <laughs> so everybody. You, you're doing great. <laughs> you're right right in the student center there. It's a, it this was louder. this was yeah <laughs> this was this was movie night. So, uh, it, all of these pieces are are designed obviously by by, by you guys. You know, I've seen your computer yes. lab. It's, yep. it's 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 really impressive. So, when you're when you're starting out on a on a suspension design, every, every year is a new car. For, for you for, for the most part um, how much design carries over from from year to year do you start with a complete clean sheet do you, yeah, so do you start with targets or do you start with with a lot of it actually gets carried over okay. um, again it's kind of similar to Porsche and the 911 right. right how much have they really changed that throughout the years they found their recipe and they stuck with it so um, now for us uh, we use we've been using the same set of tires since forever right so we're kind of slowly developing the suspension to get to the point where we like it with that tire. So our roll centers are based off somewhat of last year. We can tune them a little bit, 
uh, based on those. Uh, so what we have is like a little bracket there and we can adjust the height of that to okay. change the roll center slightly. Um, uh, stuff that would not matter as much like springs, dampers, things like that really get changed. Uh, this year, for example, we have a different cooling system, different exhaust. Uh, a lot of what we work on too is validation. So we had a great car last year and we didn't know that much about it. We went <laughs> okay. to design judging, they asked us a bunch of questions um, and we didn't really know, for example, our aero was very poorly validated. We just kind of built a wing and we're like, oh, this looks like it should do downforce. Um, so a lot of the focus that this year... That makes you feel so good because that's literally how most everybody else does it too. Yeah, so, so it's not necessarily a terrible idea, yeah. but we have found actually this year one of, uh, actually he's a freshman, uh, Kyle, shout out to you, um, found that our lowest wing element was actually stalling because of its angle of attack. So things like that you actually can find did you, out later. Did you pants him for that just because he was a freshman? That, <laughs> well, we no, congratulated but, but him. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and sometimes, you know, I think we, we've all learned at some point that, that you, can, you can do all the math, you can do all the, all the, all the modeling, but for somebody like me that you know, all my training was in English and, and uh, improv comedy, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's sometimes easier to build something that looks like something that you saw work once yes. and, then, and then trial and error t test it from there. So it's, ni it's nice to see that that is a, mm -hmm. a legit way to develop something. Yeah, so um, a lot of times, like some of these things on the car, are you take a good educated guess and then you work on developing that further. So you're not going to have a wheelbase of 10 feet. I right. mean, competition wouldn't allow it, but you know certain things about the car that you get a general range of what you want. There's a certain and then from there, you start on. really, you can, because once you get a decent working car, again, it's diminishing returns, right? You can tune a car all day long and shave tenths of seconds off. But uh, a lot of times, if you get to a point where you have a good handling, driving car, uh, like you'll obviously still want to tune it to try to get better, but it's not, uh, I guess you're not getting that much back from it anymore. Right. Okay, but, uh, let's get back to the anti. Sure. Let's, let's, let's take a look at, at, at an in, independent suspension okay. now, which is something that, so, yeah, that most so everybody's going to be So this is actually our suspension. Um, essentially, we have two control arms, and this is in the side view of the car. So we would have two points maybe here and here. Um, also talk about, get into a second, the different methods of anti because you can have uh, what's called parallel anti-squat and intersecting anti-squat okay. or dive. And so essentially this is your control arm from the side view. So it would come out of the screen and so attach to a your, wheel. Your upright right is out right, here. Yeah. And then, you know, rotate, right? So maybe your center it, of gravity. It, it's this, basically. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's actually the front uh, lower. Okay. Um, not the rear, but same thing. And you would have, I don't know, a center of gravity somewhere. And, I don't know, say your tire. Not the best tire drawing. But it's a fine tire, man. You can... Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a pretty small car, relatively. Right. But you get the point. Or so, it's, it's, it's got a center of mass. It's yeah, so the, for the this car, the important know. thing, first of all, is to find your instant center of your control arm. So with this, um, what you're really looking for is where they're intersecting. And there's a whole like circle diagram I could go into if you really wanted to get into yeah. it on how you find all these things. It's pretty much the same thing as roll center, right? So basically so, you're, you're, you're projecting yeah, the, exactly. these lines so out. Yeah, exactly. So if you project intersect. these lines out, and you will find that because they're parallel, they do not intersect. They do not intersect. So they would intersect at infinity. So your math much. is out the window, smart guy. What happens now? So. Not to be, uh, not to be afraid. We can still recover from this. Okay. So your instant center is way out there in another galaxy, and this is essentially rotating, but it's rotating in this line. So what that means is that essentially your instant center lies anywhere along this parallel axis. So um, I don't know. You could call it. It's not really like there. So the line that you would draw, because you would draw a line now from the tire contact patch to your instant center. So if you had something that intersected here, it would go there to there. But now since this is at infinity, essentially it's just following that line parallel to okay. it, right? So, and I guess we, let's talk a little bit about why the instant center is important because 
eventually a, a leverage is created between your center of mass and your instant yes, center. Yes, exactly. And that's what's going to define mm -hmm. body roll and, and yep. essentially all the weight transfer of the car. Yeah, so the instant center in is direction. essentially just what it sounds like. It's where at the instant. Um, with antis, it's kind of like a real center because it doesn't really change. Okay. Uh, this situation, right, your control arms move, they're still staying parallel to each other. So um, in this situation, your instant center is somewhere way out there. And then you would have, uh, I don't know, an angle there. And from that angle, you can find, and then you would have another angle here. And depending on what percentage this angle takes up of this is your percentage anti. So okay. if these control arms happen to be pointed directly there, right, in line with the CG, you would have 100% anti squat. Okay. So that's the parallel method. And I could show you. Well, so so let's let's unless you have any. Well, no. But before we get get rid of this, let's talk about what what we could do to change any of this. So we could, if if we if we if we want to change any of these relationships, we have to change the angle of the either either the arms. angle or we've got to move Your our center, center, of, center gravity, of mass somewhere, which is, which is probably hard easily. to do. Yes. Um, yes. So, I, I, like, I'm I'm thinking, if you went to a different tire diameter, all it's going to do is change. It might change this angle a little bit, but this this is still going to be parallel parallel there. So, if you start looking at, at going going not parallel, mm -hmm. where do you, where do you where do you start, or, or why why would you why would you use a par parallel first off versus there, uh, yeah, intersecting? Versus intersecting yeah. So with uh, in our case with an independent rear suspension, um, I actually drew this wrong. This is for a solid axle. Um, it's the same concept though, but this angle would start from here, right. as uh, we showed our everyone earlier in the book, if uh, anyone new joined. But essentially, it's now this angle. Uh, these are not the best drawings, but still parallel to that, and it's still the same angle. Okay. It's just now not drawn down here. Um, but what that does is it means you need less angle to get to your CG, okay. right? Then if you're down here and you need all this angle to get that at 100%, now you need a lot less. So what that means is you can use for independent rear suspension, parallel is generally the better way to go that I found, because we uh, explored doing both. And we found that you got uh, more anti-mobility uh, and range. So you could get quite a bit of range of adjustment with parallel versus intersecting because of this uh, torque reaction and it's starting from the center of the wheel instead of the contact patch. So now with anti-squat, or anti-dive, sorry, um, it's the same essentially as the uh, solid rear axle where your uh, instant center line is going to start from your contact patch of your tire. And um, so essentially the advantage of parallel that we found was that we could achieve more anti-squat with less point movement, which is great because that means we don't have to have as much built in there in the control arms. And it seems like it, through, through its range of motion, it's going to stay constant because those are always going to stay parallel. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so the only thing that might happen is is this line might shift up and down a little bit, but your angle isn't going to change mm -hmm. that much. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if, if they weren't parallel, your instant center would be basically sliding forward and backward during during motion, wouldn't it? Well, no. So essentially, on uh, a uh, independent rear suspension, even if these were intersecting, let's say this was no longer here. Let's say this was angled downwards. Okay. Now this is going to intersect at some point. Now, as these control arms move, they're still pivoting about this same, uh, I guess, link, if you want to call okay. it, or center right here. So the control arm will have an instant center about here. The top control arm will have its instant center, but essentially it's staying in line with that, that plane. So that doesn't actually change, and that's why I said it before, it's kind of, you could consider it a real center okay. because it's instant center usually implies that it changes with time. Okay. So when, you're, when, you, when, when you have parallels, what other advantages are there maybe in something like like um, camber gain throughout, throughout travel? Are, are there are there, there are other other advantages there? I, I would think a, a parallel one, you wouldn't get much toe change at all either, would you? Yeah, so that's that's another, I guess, advantage of the parallel is it's a little easier to deal with the toe change 
Um, and it, essentially the toe change, you can pretty much dial out the toe change with either method. It's just uh, a concept of aligning your tie rod or toe link in plane with the way that the arms are rotating. I could draw a, a front view of the roll centers if you wanted to get into that. Or... Yeah, I'll tell you what, actually, uh, let's, let's, let's take, a, take a break quick. I want to get, um, get, get Micah in here for, 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 for a few minutes. Sure. So why don't, why don't you, um, Katie, um, We'll, well, when we come back, we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll talk about anti-dive a little bit. All right. And, and, and get into that stuff. But let's get, let's get uh, Micah over here real, real quick. So Katie's going to switch their mics around. And I want to, before we get back into the tech stuff and my brain starts leaking out my, my left ear even further, I uh, want to talk a little bit about the business side of Formula SAE because it is not all, it is not all design. Come on over. All right. Micah Martin, everybody. Welcome. Here. Thanks for being here. So we've we've been chatting with uh, with with the the, the Embry Riddle SAE team. First off, it, it's great having you guys here. I mean, I've lived in this town for 30 years now, and we've seen we've seen this. Uh, Katie's asking me to be taller. I think um, I can't. I've I've been trying for 50 years. I, can, I cannot. Like yes. it. <laughs> but it's really cool to see uh, you know our local school. Being uh, competing in in such a you know a, a, a national high end venue like this, but it's not all design. There is a business component too. So you're in charge of that. And what is what is the business component to Formula SA? So basically, uh, whenever we explain what we do to people, they usually say, "Oh, you build a car, you race it, you see if you win." Well, we get judged on our designs and our race performance, uh, but we also have to market this car to the consumer. And so we have to find a market, we have to find a hole in the market that we can fill, and then we have to kind of tweak our, we do a business presentation, right. which is sort of like Shark Tank, where we say, you're an investor with $100,000 in your pocket, right? No, uh, <laughs> thank you, but yeah. And we have this business that we want you to invest in, and we make this many cars a year, it costs you this much, you get this return on investment. And so... We're not on CNBC, but we do our best. Awesome. And uh, one, one thing we um, actually, I have to sneeze. Give them the quick pitch and uh, tell them about, about, about the website. And I'm, um, I'll, I'll deal with this. OK. So basically, we have a link for you to fill out a survey for us. It only takes about five minutes. It's a tiny URL, URL link. Um, it's going to ask you some demographics questions. Uh, feel free to skip any question you feel uncomfortable with. Um, we don't want to kind of scare you away with our, our questioning, but all, question, all answers are going to be in a password protected server, and so all your information will be safe. So it's going to ask you some demographics questions about you, but then it's going to ask you your interest in motorsport and interest with. Uh, he's doing a great job. No, no. <laughs> interest no, in motorsport and what you look it's, for. It's going to be so much worse than this at the competition, believe, believe me. <laughs> if, you can, if you can deal with this tonight, you're going to kill at, the, at that, 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 that competition. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's a few sim simple questions. It's going to be a huge help to, to these guys. And I, I hope you guys are going to come back and talk to us about more tech tips. And I, I literally, every time you want to do that, if you want some, some, a few minutes to work on, on, on the pitch, uh, f feel free. Because any resources we can provide to you guys, we would love to see you guys just absolutely go, go to Lincoln, go to Michigan, and kill. Absolutely. So. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, we can we can be screwed up in the background. Actually, watch, watch this. Hey, friends, are you like me? I'm JG Pastor Jack from Grassroots Motorsports Live. Is every waking moment of your life a nightmare from which there is no recovery? You just wait to crawl home and get into a bottle every single night. Well, maybe you can relieve some of the hellish, crushing pressure on your life with some CRC brake clean. Wouldn't that be great? I'm sure CRC is very proud to hear this. Actually, uh, they're proud supporters of the show. Uh, they make great products. We've been huge fans of theirs for as long or longer than they have been fans of ours. They are supporters of not only this show, but fantastic events like our $2,000 challenge. They are uh, supporters of race teams like our friends uh, at Bimmer World. James Clay up there is a, a proud flyer of the CRC flag. And when you're at a retailer, when you're at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot or Walmart or Harbor Freight, Advanced Auto Parts, Napa, O'Reilly, and you're buying that CRC stuff, you're, you're getting a great product. Everybody knows how great brake clean is. Everybody knows how great the, the, the display cleaner is. 
but you're also giving a little bit back to the motorsports community, and that's what we really appreciate. So, uh, yeah, next time, next time you're buying any automotive chemicals, help help a brother out. Also, check out our friends at Coney Shocks, Coney-NA.com. Whether you have to damp an autocross Miata or uh, a BMW that you're driving from coast to coast, or a train car, or a building, or a bridge. Coney has shocks for you, madam or sir. Coney-NA.com on the web, also available great retailers like Tire Rack. That's how it's done, my friend. All right, uh, thanks for coming on. We, uh, we, we Everybody go fill, fill that survey yeah, out please. after the show. Uh, trade, trade mics again with, uh, with right, your, your tall you. friend with the, with, with the good looking hair. And we will get back to the uh, the nerd stuff here. All right, <laughs> yeah, Danette says clean away all your problems. Kate, can somebody can somebody figure out what the the whole top fan thing is? Um, we have uh, we have we have top fans on on Facebook now. So I'm not one of them. and yeah, and, and and people that work here aren't one of them. So maybe uh, somebody figure that out. Maybe we'll start giving prizes away to uh, to top fans. Okay, so back to the nerd we, stuff. Yes, we, right. we, we left off uh, with um, with anti squat. We're gonna talk talk about the instant centers from from the front a little bit. I think. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, so let's, let's um, essentially, what we're gonna go over now is uh, tie rod and toe link location and how that can influence bump steer. <laughs> yeah. That. See, that, that, that doesn't really even help. Because I'm, I'm going to fall, and then... It's, it's the camera adding all, the, all that height to them. Okay, so uh, in this view, this is the same way you would look at uh, determining a roll center. So maybe you have a tire here, tire here, your ground. and some control arms. And I can already see that you're, you're a spoiled formula car guy because you've designed the angle of your upper here for ideal camber gain as this, as this goes Yes, so camber gain up, so is yeah. a function of side view swing arm length and essentially what that is is, again, we're looking at the intersection of where these control arms intersect. Yeah. So for these, it'll be somewhere over here. And I guess you would call this actually your front view swing arm length. Uh, but essentially what that is, the shorter this distance is, so the more direct those are right. intersecting, it means that uh, for a given amount of rotation, your tire will turn a given amount and give more or less camber. So that's the, something the, that... The, the, the aggregate swing, essentially, is rotating around, it around is this It is a function this point, of this basically. length. Yeah. So... So that length is important for camera game, but that's a little off topic. Yeah. And then. And, and, and the reason I mentioned that is because so many of us don't get to, to live in a, in, a, in a world, especially those of us that have to deal with, well, like, like McPherson's trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to deal with, with, with roll centers. Where you don't get to choose that. It, the, you don't get to choose that. Or as soon as you, as soon as you change ride height, your roll centers just go, go crazy and mm -hmm. you've got to. Do, yep. do, do a lot of work, you know, to, uh, to, to to fix them. So let's yeah, let's let's look at the the idealized ver version here and get a feel for what's going on, and then we'll talk about some ways to deal with it. So then here would be essentially if you have a parallel car, which you should, unless you're going NASCAR, yeah. uh, you would have your instant centers of the tire, each individual tire about the body, and then what you're trying to find for your roll center is the instant center of the chassis about the ground. So here's the intersection of the tire and the ground. And then you're looking at this line right here as it goes to there, this line right here as it goes to there. And the way I drew this, it's hard to see the distinction, but uh, usually that's somewhere below uh, your side roll right. centers. And so there would be where your roll center is. Now, um, essentially, for antis, what you're looking at is through travel, how does your toe change? Okay. So depending on you have some type of tie rod, right? And depending on where this tie rod is and the instant center that that makes, that determines whether or not you will have any toe 
as this moves through travel. Okay. So if this tie rod is angled perfectly towards your uh, your roll center, then essentially you don't have any uh, toe gain because now as as this goes through its travel, this effective length is staying moves, the same. Moves with it, basically. Yeah, moves so, yeah, with it, yeah. exactly. So it's it does not change, whereas if it was above over here or something, then maybe as this moves, then this is moving a different amount, right? So then that is what contributes to you having a toe gain or a bump steer is what a lot of people refer to it which, as. Which tends to be the same reason when you lower a streetcar and you, you take these, these these roll centers and drop them down to nothing, and then you take your, mm -hmm. your tie rods and, you don't and point. And the tie rod. Then, right, yep, and, yeah, and they're pointing upwards game. all of a sudden. You, you're, you, you, get, you get crazy bump steer. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm hooked now. Let's, uh, <laughs> we got somebody checking in from the uh, the ERAO FS, FSAE plastic slave, uh, Ga Gabriel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, th thanks for joining us. Yeah, uh, b shout out to everybody else from, from the team that couldn't make it. We, we, we like to, at some point, want to get all you guys here teaching us awesome stuff, or maybe um, we'll, we'll, we'll come down come down to you on that and have you, have you teach us awesome stuff. Anything we can do to to leverage your your giant brains and teach our, our viewers more stuff, I, I think it's going to be awesome. So, all right, so, so let's talk a little bit about anti squat in the front, because that's that I, I would think is going to affect things like braking performance or. Um, yes. Or especially uh, a front wheel drive car. Um, yeah, not too many front wheel drive cars with uh, with A-arm suspensions, except except Hondas, really. But um, that that's going to be a, a, a fairly large. Um, so uh, essentially, if you were doing a front wheel drive car, you're looking at again the same thing that we showed with yeah. this solid rear axle, where the torque is reacted by the control arms. So that just changes where your uh, line drawn from the instant center is going to start from, essentially. That's all that really does. Um, gotcha. As for anti-dive, so on our car, we actually decided to do intersecting. So in the rear anti-squat, we have parallel line day arms, right. and we can change that. And another thing I didn't really show you, so on these, um, essentially these have bearings pressed into them and they pick up at some point along the chassis. They're spherical bearings and they're allowed to rotate. And what we did is change the length. This was actually my design for senior design. Um, we have like a bolt, say, passing through this. I made a volcano for my Down to the bottom. It was, it was cool. Wow. I did a show about clowns. <laughs> yeah. And then, so, essentially you would have this would attach somewhere along there and we have enough room provisions for this to angle oh, wow. at different angles. Okay. So we can actually adjust our anti-squat by changing out the spacers. In oh, that. very cool. And so that was my project this year. Um, now for the so, front. So, so you actually have to have to remove the bolt. To remove it. Put it yeah. Could, could, you, could you design uh, like a, a screw jack? Oh, yeah. There's, that, I mean, there's that, plenty that be, of other ways yeah. to do it. That was just the way we did it because it was light yeah. and... Uh, efficient this was the same way we had the bracket done from last year we just extended it from an inch to an inch and a half oh, cool. and then it gave us some more variability in there uh, we actually ended up angling our uh, the suspension like bars on the chassis slightly to give like a little bit of nominal like it's already at some small value i forget exactly what it was but uh we did do that to to aid in that okay. um and then so back to this yeah, yeah so let's talk about dive in the front before we before I tangent us off into more stupid crap. So really you're looking at pretty much the exact same thing we were showing before, except, uh, oh wow, that was an awful circle. Okay. It, it was several nice circles. But. <laughs> right, center of gravity. Oh, nope. <laughs> Well, you can draw your center of gravity however you yeah, want. Yeah, but he's a theater major over there is is g giving you crap now. So uh, same thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Essentially, you have a line going directly from there to there. You have a height that that is above the ground. You have some distance. You could call that I don't know L. That that is from the front tire and then some angle theta maybe. And now your control arms, let's say, 
we're going to do intersecting just for the first part because that is what we decided to do on this year's car. So it's going to look something like this, which looks a little weird. You're like, why is that angle down? Yeah. But what that does is it gives you an intersection point somewhere along here. And then that angle, which you could call alpha maybe, uh, and depending on what that is, the tangent of that over the H over L, right? So um, that would give you your percentage. So again, same thing if you had this directly at the CG, that's 100%. If, it's, if they're parallel, then that's at infinity. It's not intersecting anywhere, so you'd have zero. Okay, so what actually happens, like what are, when we, when we apply a force to this, when we, when we transfer weight forward onto these and, 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 and these start, start to compress, what does that anti-squat or that anti-dive now actually do to to the chassis? Is it is it actually resisting some of some of that that, that weight transfer going going yes. forward, or is so, it changing the rate, or what's it? Um, same thing as the anti-dive right. again, where you'd have some type of spring maybe connected up here or, or something connected to your uh, to your wheel, and that's going to take up a portion of it, and your antis will take up a portion, and depending on where that is, that would determine that the portion that that takes up, and really how that works is. It's all geometry. So if this is rotating around there, then there's no moment created. Right. So whereas if this is down here, then you have that distance creating a moment when this tries to rotate, right? Okay. So um, at 100%, you would have instant load transfer. So when you would hit the brakes, now all your load transfer is going instantly to your front tires. There's no real time constant behind that. And with a spring, you have some type of time constant. A lighter sprung car is going to take more time to fully load transfer the front tires versus a stiffer sprung car, right? Um, so that's okay. essentially what that's doing at that level. So what what do what do ideal rates tend tend to be for for the, these concepts? So our nominal about? rate that we have not tested yet because the car is not built yet. Right is 15% uh, and I think we were going to do 20% anti-squat in the rear just to test it out. That's about what I've heard. People don't go a lot over that on road cars and I think it's just because it becomes hard to drive. Right. It becomes like a little unpredictable. Essentially at 100% antis you're creating a go-kart. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're sort of through, through, through the leverages of the suspension, mm -hmm. you're essentially not allowing it to, to travel or I, I would think you, you act, actually, if you got that angle extreme enough, you could hit the brakes and the front end would actually actually rise on you, wouldn't, couldn't it? I mean, like yes. Same, same thing well, with, yeah, with, with so the if you, had, yeah. if you had this above your center of gravity, then the front uh, unsprung mass could rise, yeah. of, or no, the front sprung mass would rise above the unsprung mass. Whereas in this case, your unsprung mass is moving uh, relative to your sprung mass up here. Okay, so when we talk about changing this stuff, we're generally talking about changing the height of the mounting points of the of, of the front yes, or, exactly. or, or rear, rear pivots. So, so yeah, what is that for, for us? I'm, I'm trying to think of common street cars. Like for, for, a, for a trailing arm car, you could you could shim a, shim a, a mount point up, mm -hmm. up and down, but. Yeah, what you're really looking yeah. at is essentially your linkages and then you need to find where that rotates about. Yeah. And that's going to change depending on your geometry. There's a lot of different types of suspension geometry out there, so there's a lot of different ways that that can work. But it all comes down, boils down to one concept, which is where is your instant center and how far is it from your center of gravity? And um, so in this case, like uh, for us, what we did, we have those brackets again, so maybe right. we have this much amount of room on there. And then we can, say, move this point down to here and maybe this point up to here. And now our line looks more like this, and oh, now we're at 100% uh, anti-dive. So we don't actually have range of adjustment that far. I think but our maximum yeah, range yeah. is somewhere around 60%, but we can go anywhere from zero to 60% anti-dive. Yeah, and, and and it sounds like in in, in most cars you're you're dealing with um, what are you what, what are you pointing at there, Katie? Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I I, I saw you pointing at that that little, little line over there, and thinking, yeah, it's it's that kid. Kitty's tapping over there. Um, okay, gotcha. So, so we're, we're basically looking at, at, at raising and lowering front and rear mounts. And then, like we mentioned before, as, as, as you change that stuff, especially in the front, it's gonna, it could start doing weird stuff as, as they articulate to 
to to your toe lengths especially I, mm -hmm. I would think so that's that's the other thing so if we're going to change antis then we'll, we also have a provision in there to change the uh angle of the toe link and so as uh as your antis change at, that's at the the hub or at the at the rack at the uh at the wheels at the oh, upright okay. So um, you can do it a little bit at the rack too, I think, just because there's a little room there. And we use custom machined aluminum spacers, so I can go hop on the lathe and make those to whatever size I want. And then uh, a nice program, actually. So it would be awful to just go and do this by hand every I, single I time. Know. So there's a program we use, Lotus Shark, uh, which is what Lotus uses to develop their suspensions. Wow. And It'll basically just, you put in all these hard points and it'll tell you where it is. So it's a little bit cheating, that's, that's but so cool. you do yeah. need to understand the concept. It, well, yeah, and, and, and you're, it, it just basically, you're, you're doing the same thing you would be doing through testing. You're just mm -hmm. taking a, a lot of the trial and error out and getting, getting right to it. So when, when you're tuning a, a car or when, when, when this new car is done and you go out and, and come up with a baseline and then start doing your actual, actual shakedown, where do you start on 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 your baseline? You're basically gonna, you're gonna like how do you even determine your 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 baseline settings for all this stuff? So our baselines are kind of set nominally at 15% front, 20% back. Uh, probably the first time we run the car, we'll run at zero, just because that's what the car has been running this entire time. And then from there, gradually dial it in until okay. we get to a point that we like. Um, another big advantage of this too is it decreases suspension travel in dive or acceleration. So that can be very uh, lucrative on a high aero car like Formula One and in our case, Formula SAE. So that front wing, its height is very important for aerodynamic effects. If that changes aero stability, that's not necessarily always a good thing. So limiting how much that wing moves is a big advantage of anti-dive. And that's a big reason we incorporated this year. Last year, we were hitting the front wing on the ground oh, right. when we would hit the brakes, and it was kind of destroying the wing. So that's uh, another reason we have that in there. Now, there are other ways to basically do the same concept. Anti is not the only one. Um, like I said, you lose damping, right? right? So what some cars do, like Formula One cars, they have a third spring that essentially geometrically only works in uh, pitch with the car pitching. Oh, okay. So uh, you'll have your normal ride springs like usual and then some third spring that essentially works th in this direction and that would have a damper in it so you can incorporate damping into that and then custom adjust that spring rate, which essentially that's all this is doing is stiffening your springs. Gotcha. Uh, somebody uh, on Facebook here, uh, Justin, wants to know about, about load cells and, and using, using that to validate suspension settings. When, when you guys start doing, doing your testings, what kind of data acquisition are, are, you, are you using on, on all these pieces? Yes, yeah, so we do have load cells. We have uh, linear potentiometers on the spring that can tell us how much springs we're using at different points. We have wheel speed sensors on the car, so we can compare that. We even have GPS, so we can compare, say, wheel speed sensors to a GPS speed and then determine if we are slipping the tires or not, mm -hmm. and you could generate kind of an average slip ratio. Um, like one good thing you can do with uh, those load cells and the potentiometers is validate what you designed. So is this car at, and it has an accelerometer too, so at 2 Gs, how much are we compressing the springs? Is that in line with what I predicted it would be? Um, what are the low, what is the load transfer at 2 Gs, right? That can help you determine your center of gravity. I mean, you wouldn't want to determine it that way, but that could validate that you had it correct. Right. Um, Again, there's, there's plenty of different things. Load cells are also useful for aero downforce. Like we run the car at, I don't know, say 40 miles an hour, uh, just a constant steady state, and measure the added force, and that's essentially your aero downforce. So yeah, there's tons of room for instrumentation, and mostly it's to validate the models yeah. that we produce. All right, so a lot of, lot of great concepts here. They all need to be put into action eventually through whoever is sitting in that seat behind behind that that steering wheel mm -hmm. how how much thought have you guys given to actually the the interface between the engineers and and the drivers you know are, are you are you getting used to working with a driver and trying to take take the feedback from that that driver and actually implement it or or comparing that to the, Definitely. the hard data yeah. you're getting? so there is there is no perfect car, right? right? You could set up a suspension, you change one thing, and that suddenly changes other things. And it may produce undesirable effects in one way. Maybe you get 
your roll bar is right, but now you don't like the spring rates anymore or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff like that that plays into driver feel. Again, some may prefer a slightly understeering car, some might prefer a slightly oversteering car. And then there's, you have steady state oversteer and understeer. You have transient overstate, oversteer and understeer, uh, which is basically your corner exits and right. corner entries. So um, yeah, driver feedback is hugely important for us. Uh, I would, that's probably the main method of tuning really is I'll put a setup on the car that I think it should drive like, and if they come back and tell me that they don't like it at all, <laughs> that they can't drive it, then we have to find a different setup. Or, so, or, or a different driver. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe that's what it really needs to be. But uh, it's good that our drivers are also our engineers. So yeah, one of them is cool. our team lead. One of them is our uh, technical director, who's been on the team for four years. That was Max. You spoke yep. of him last time he was on the show. And he knows a ton about this stuff. So uh, he kind of has a good grasp of like where the car should be. and. Uh, has driven a number of different cars that we've made throughout the years. So driver feedback is definitely very important. Awesome. And uh, that's actually why I went with incorporating uh, adjustable anti-squat and dive into this year's car. Uh, that was given my senior design project was just to do some type of anti effect. And I went and said, well, you know, why don't we make it adjustable? So then if the driver doesn't like it this much, we tune it down, we tune it up and we get it where we like it. Awesome. All right. We could talk about this all night, but sure. uh, we, 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 we technically have to have to go soon because we are running short on time. Uh, thanks, everybody that, that joined us. I'm going to see uh, if we missed any any questions there. Oh, uh, so, yeah, yeah, Jeff asked um, if a lot of anti-dive tends to bind the front suspension. Under yes, braking, which is it does, yeah, which is kind of the point that's exactly of it to what some it does. extent, but yeah, mm -hmm. and it, and uh, the corollary to that was uh, somebody on on YouTube I saw mentioned that if you have a lousy suspension design, the best way to get it get is don't get let it work. work. It's don't let it move. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So, which is the, the Formula Five Hundred method, basically, where yeah, I I forget who said it, but the quote was, uh, and you can make any suspension work as long as you don't let it. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things we we've, we've noticed with uh, I have a Formula Five Hundred and the. I mean, there is a suspension on it, there's, mm -hmm. but essentially, with the, the I, I think we, I run the same tires you guys do, the, the 10 inch Hoosier, Hoosier R R20, 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 R20 Bs, yeah. And um, that's that's more suspension articulation in the sidewall of those tires mm -hmm. than exactly. it generally is through, through, through your suspension. Yes, so you can do definitely. all of this work, and then you still got five and inches then the of tire squishy ruins tire. It all. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So awesome. That's actually why next year we're hoping to go to lower profile tires for that reason, so that they're a little more predictable. But we do get tire data from CalSpan. They test the tires on a tire testing rig. And so we can see stuff like that. We can actually get a, it's not linear obviously, but right. we can get a spring rate for the tire and model it as such. It has hysteresis damping in there and uh, all different stuff like that. So yeah, definitely uh, tires can make things a lot more unpredictable. And the smaller tire you have, the generally lower profile tire you have, the more predictable it is because it moves less. Well, the, the, the more predictable the modeling is, I think, but, yeah, but maybe yeah. not as like, we, 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 predictable as, as, as mathematically predictable, but not, yeah. not necessarily Not necessarily driving. Behind the wheel so thing. driving, yeah. again, that has to do, there's so many factors that play into tire design, yeah. compounds, uh, what temperature it likes to be at, yeah. uh, tread pattern, like all those things. So that comes down to being on a testing rig and every tire is different inflation pressures are huge too that's probably uh one of the biggest things you can do to uh, change how your car rides is just experiment with uh, tire, pressures, tire yeah. pressures all right so what are you doing after you're you said you're graduating soon maybe do get getting a master's but what uh when you're out in the private sector you, the from what i hear the the sae program at riddle has got a near 100 percent uh, placement rate. So what's what's your, your your dream job out there in a few years? Dream job and goal would be doing anything with race cars. So mm -hmm. any type of vehicle modeling, uh, dynamic modeling, like uh, I've, we have uh, experimented with like Adam's car a little bit, uh, just suspension design, anything like that, especially uh, if it had to do with a race team or something like that. I essentially would love to do this full time as a job. So cool. All right. Thank you very much for coming out, you guys. Thanks to, thanks to Micah. Uh, we will be seeing seeing more of these guys. Um, we, 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 there's a bunch of systems on, on on the car that we can definitely you know get get more more of this info. Before we go, let me remind you one more time about their survey. Go fill out their survey. Help this team out. They're going to be using that data as they go into competition here. When when did, when's your your competition actually start? When when's the car supposed to be done? 
May. Okay. So oh, it, it, yeah, May eighth. So. Um, oh yeah, and uh, yeah. So yeah, fill, fill, fill their survey out. Huge help for them. Also, if you want updates on show schedule, what's coming up, what's uh, what, what's happening, who the guests are, I want you to text G R M Live G R M L I V E to three one nine nine six. For example, you will find out that next week it looks like uh, not one hundred percent yet, but you'll be getting a text as soon as we know about this. Looks like we're doing a Thursday show next week. We're going to have some guests from the Optima Ultimate Streetcar event. It's going to be here in Daytona. We'll be competing with our Corvette next weekend, and uh, all the Optima competitors will be in town. We might invite a few of them out here, get you guys a closer look at some of those amazing machines. And that's going to be a Thursday show instead of our usual Wednesday show. But as soon as we confirm that, we will text you an update on what's going on then. So text GRM Live, GRM L I V E to 31996. Folks, uh, that is it. Let me. Uh, uh, yeah, so real, real quick before, before we go, Darius wants to know how much testing and tuning will you guys do before, before the event? Once the car is finished, how much, how much testing time? As much as possible. As, yeah, yeah, the answer is as, as much as possible, obviously. I know. Um, you're going to Brooksville next weekend for some autocross for, for some driver training, actually. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 their first event is in May and it's uh, it's April already and the car is not quite done. So um, yeah, the, the, they're they're a little behind schedule and and you guys have time booked down to shuttle landing facility too. I think I heard. so. Yeah, um, the the the. How much time does it take is a different question than how much time do they have, uh, Darius. So the, uh, the, the answer is probably if it's like anybody else's race car, the car is never perfect. And the more testing you can do, the better prepared you are for the event. And these guys are just like any other race team in that, you know, there is a finite amount of time that they have, have to work with. So uh, hopefully, hopefully they will get plenty of test time in before that first event. Before we go, I, I, I love this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to keep this actually to use for, for shows. But uh, before we go, please, please, please give uh, spare a thought for our friends at CRC Industries. CRCindustries.com on the web, even better. Check them out at a major retailer near you. Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, uh, Harbor Freight, Advanced Auto Parts, O'Reilly, Napa. Any of those places have the CRC stuff. Everybody knows what a fantastic product Brake Clean is. Everybody knows what a fantastic product. Somebody mentioned uh, Freeze Off. Yes, uh, Chris, get, get, get a shot back there. We got a whole row of Freeze Off back there. We love the Freeze Off, baby. It's great stuff. Whether you're uh, trying to trying to loosen a bolt, trying to uh, clean clean a carburetor, trying to um, clean clean your brakes, whatever. Kate, Katie's back from her uh, her quad root canal last week, so so wel welcome her back. Um, I'm talking about your quad root canal or your quad uh, not, uh, uh, wisdom teeth. I had all four wisdom teeth out last, uh, last week. You have four or less wisdom teeth, and and you're back on the job this week. That's that's amazing. Congratulations to you, young lady. Yeah, Kenny had an audition on, on, on Sunday, four days after having all four wisdom teeth out. Uh, anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah, this stuff's awesome. By the way, crcindustries.com on the web, at a retailer near you, and they make a great product, and they also support shows like this, events like our $2,000 challenge, motorsports at every single level. So please, uh, please, please do spare a thought for them. What would people want? Oh, yeah. That is, uh, th that is where you're, you're going to go to take their survey. We'll throw that up in the, in the chats as well. And uh, also, talk about our friends at Coney Shocks, coney-na.com on the web. Lovely people, fantastic shock absorbers. Whether you're competing, driving on the street, whether you're doing track events, uh, time, time trials, road racing, Coney has a shock for you. Check them out online, coney-na.com, or at great retailers like Tire Rack. And if you call Coney, with a tech question. They will be happy, happy, happy to help you out. They are fantastic people. They are knowledgeable and they are a benefit to our entire scene. All right, folks, that's it. We'll see you again next week. Probably going to be on Thursday. Text GRM Live to 31996 to be first to know about schedule updates and guests. In the meantime, thank you very much to the uh, entire squad there at the Embry Riddle Aeronautical Uni University's Formula SAE team. I'm going to call them a squad, Katie. Because that's, that's, that's how we roll. They're a, they're a, a, a cohort, uh, a, a collective. Uh, yeah, th thanks to all those guys. Look forward to working with them on more great tech topics in the future. Thanks to our friends at CRC and Coney. Thanks to Chris behind the camera. Thanks to Katie over there running the board. Thanks to David 
uh, running our social media tonight. I'm JG Pastor Jack. This is Grassroots Motorsports Live presented by CRC Industries. We'll see you again next week. Good night, everybody.